afternoon. Thank you for joining us for our webinar, Digital Disguises for Cyber Operations. We have two subject matter experts here to talk to you about emerging techniques that today's red teams, threat hunters, and other cyber professionals use to conduct their operations. First, we have Tom Batters. Tom's focus is on network capabilities to protect organizations and individuals from cyber threats. He has extensive knowledge and expertise in managed attribution, obfuscation, and encryption for cloud and premise-based networks. Leveraging over 40 years of experience in network integration, Tom drives the strategy and direction for Telos' cloud-based managed attribution products and services business, and in turn provides industry leadership for the development of obfuscation technology to help eliminate attack surfaces targeted by cyber adversaries. We also have David Vaughn, David is a highly respected senior strategist with a proven track record of effectively understanding and communicating contextual business requirements to both technical and non-technical leadership. He is a lead information security researcher for a large financial services corporation. Previously, he was a corporate information security officer with Brand and Trust. And prior to joining BBNT, he served as a chief information security officer for cyber defense technologies. Go ahead and take Thank you, Caitlin. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. And thank you, David, for joining us today. So for the next 45 minutes or so, uh, we're going to talk about some of the needs of cyber operators, uh, security researchers, red teamers, and so on. Uh, the need to avoid detection and why that's important in the performance of their job. We'll cover things uh, like the need for detection avoidance, uh, some of the digital disguises uh, that are necessary for the performance of those jobs, uh, and talk a little bit about uh, attribution. Uh, we'll talk about the setting up of non-attributable infrastructure, and then from the, the perspective of attribution, the different types, uh, misattribution, managed attribution, and why each one is important in specific ways. Uh, and then we want to touch a little bit on not just the tools and techniques uh, that, that may be effective in those environments, but uh, also how to set them up properly so that they're not actually doing damage and making you, uh, uh, you know, appear with unwanted uh, uh, capabilities out on the Internet. And then we'll just talk about some commercially available uh, capabilities that, that, uh, that are out on the market today. So as a quick introduction, um, as everyone is you know, painfully aware, uh, there's increasing frequency and sophistication of cyber attacks. Um, and then a, a lot of organizations, whether they're commercial organizations, retail, healthcare, or public sector, intelligence organizations, they're establishing uh, research groups. Uh, ensuring that they have the personnel necessary to protect their organization. Uh, and they have a need to disguise themselves uh, and, and to protect themselves. A lot of infrastructure is required to make that happen, a lot of tools and so on. So with David's help today, uh, we hope to provide some information and real world examples regarding the need for and the importance of uh, establishing a network environment to ensure secure and private way to use the internet for cyber operations. Hey Tom, thank you very much for, for having me. I, I just wanted to start out by saying that my participation in this webinar is, is not an endorsement of any product by myself or my employer. Uh, any thoughts or opinions are my own as an industry recognized cyber professional and, and do not represent uh, my employers. Great, thanks again for, uh, for, for being with us today, David. Thanks for having me. Um, so, so the need avoidance, um, as I mentioned before, a number of groups, you know, a number of organizations are setting up these groups. Probably every you know medium to large organization has a group that's starting to focus on this, uh, and these groups need to be able to use networks and tools and, and the internet to do their job without opening up attack surfaces. Uh, so the various types of cyber ops, you know, they, they need to uh, disguise their identities or their personnel, uh, you know, whether they're red teams, pen testers, security researchers, and so on. 
So the, the title of our webinar refers specifically to red teams, but as, as you'll see throughout this discussion, uh, these types of capabilities extend well beyond just the red teamer, and we'll get into some of that as we go through. So David, as a, as a security researcher, can you discuss some of the specific reasons why detection avoidance is so important uh, and what some of the risks are for potential attack vectors that can be open? Absolutely, but let's start out uh, mentioning one of my favorite speakers in the industry is Simon Sinek. He's known for saying uh, everything starts with why, and that's important in this case, right, because we want to talk about why we have security researchers, why we have red teaming. The overall goal is reducing risk to the enterprise, right? So red teams and, and researchers will have inadvertently created uh, false positives with their search activity or are, you know, by limited, they're limited by inline tools, right? So if there's uh, restrictive uh, proxies in place, they might not be able to have a full reign to do the research that they need to do while uh, at the organization. Uh, enterprise may not want that type of uh, data out there, right? Like uh, maybe they're trying to do competitive analysis and, you know, uh, for example, Coke doesn't want uh, Pepsi to know that they're doing competitive analysis, right? Everybody knows that they do that. Nobody wants it tied back to them, right? right they want to have right. a competitive edge. So I think that's the, the, the why that starts this conversation of why is it so important to have anonymity and, you know, where that conversation starts both with the individual or with the, the enterprise. Yeah, so it's not only about opening attack vectors, but it's also about, you know, knowing that they're doing that kind of work specifically. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so for, uh, it, it, like I said before, it's not just, you know, red teams and pen testers that have this, right? It's, uh, there are a lot of other organizations and types of activities uh, that require online anonymity, right? It, desired for more than just the red team activities. And I've listed here just some of the, uh, the, the leading requirements for this type, and that we're going to re re be referring back to these uh, as we go through these discussions. And then we'll get into more detail about these specific things um, later in the discussion. You know, so when, when thinking about advanced adversaries, especially with the, the things on this slide, I think it's important to remember that um, the, the good adversaries, right, not the low hanging fruit, but they, they collect data from millions of sources. Right? Uh, if your organization requires anonymity or its activities, whether it's red teaming or researching, you know, they should gauge in it 100% of the time. And, and if choosing a partner to provide this as a service, they should be trusted. And in the beginning, some hard questions should be asked, right, to protect the interests of the company. Great. Yes, like I say, we'll dig a little bit more into those details as we go further into the discussion. So uh, I'd like to talk just for a few minutes and, and get into uh, the uh, establishment of the infrastructure and networking capabilities that are needed to do this kind of work. So, you know, we're, we're talking about the need for a cyber operator to operate securely and privately, right, so they can do their jobs without unwanted attention themselves. Uh, so one of the keys to doing that is to set up and establish the correct networking environment. So D David, can you talk about uh, a, a little bit about the establishment of non-attributable networks and their components and why they're so important to making sure uh, that, that these folks meet their needs? Well, I mean, the, you know, the, the number one thing, right, is the cost of doing so. Um, you know, you, you really only see that happening in large organizations. We won't even have the conversation about, uh, you know, states and organizations that work for the state having the resources to do that. But the cost of doing it and doing it right um, has to be 100 percent, right? You have to be right 100 percent of the time. You can't afford that one time where something is attributable back to the organization, right? Like you, you, you should have that inherent level of trust within the organization, great power comes great responsibility. Yeah. But, uh, you know, if you're going to do it on your own, um, you, you need to do it right 100% of the time. Because if there's cyber adversaries out there looking at your activity, they're waiting for that one time. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and the thing is, sorry, right, we talked about that earlier, uh, when we were, we were planning all this, is uh, adversaries are collecting data all the time. 
everywhere from millions of sources, right? And uh, you, it, it doesn't take a lot of effort to correlate and aggregate that data um, to identify people so that they're continuously identified each time they come and do something. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to spend just the next few slots thinking about something that, you know, David, you and I have discussed this before a number of times, but uh, whenever there's discussion about, you know, cyber operators and, and what they need to do and how they need to set up their environment, uh, there's always discussion about various types of attribution, right? Uh, uh, attribution there's different types, uh, there's, there's different ways that a cyber operator would want to use a specific type of attribution, uh, uh, attribution, misattribution, and so on, and when they may not apply to their specific you know, current mission, right? So uh, I'd like to walk through the next uh, couple of slides and talk about some of those things. Absolutely. So uh, let, let's start with non-attribution. So typically when I hear non-attribution, I think so anything I do on the internet will never be attributed to me because I'm non-attributable, right? So you know, how true is that in, in the real world? Well, I, I right? offer a little bit of conjecture, right? You know, since there's a discussion here, it really breaks down to technical versus non-technical, right? And, and to your point, right, um, you don't want something tied back to you, but you also want to stick out, right? So Let's say you're doing a non-attribution thing in a geographical area. Um, you want to look like you're just like a regular person in that geographical area. Right? So if I'm totally non-attributable and my activity is coming out at some specific location, someone's looking at that saying, hey, this guy, there's nothing here. There's got to be something suspicious, right? I, I, would, I wouldn't go that far. I would say that you're not Tom Batter, right? Like you are just a regular person amongst the crowd of many, right? You're uh, the, the needle in a haystack of haystacks, right? right. Um, uh, you, when you start getting into uh, impersonation and uh, persona development, stuff like that, that's a little bit different. So we'll, we'll probably cover that briefly. Uh, right. But I, I would say that non-attribution is not coming back to a identity or an attack. Great. That's great. So that, that kind of brings us to you know, the, the misattribution piece of this. So from a misattribution perspective, of course, there's, you know, it, it, when I read about or hear about misattribution, you know, there are very people talk about that, right? So uh, it, typically uh, in cyber research and so on, misattribution is incorrectly identifying someone, right, of, a, of an illegal cyber activity. So that's one type or definition of misattribution. What I'd kind of like to really focus on in this discussion, though, uh, is uh, as a red teamer, misattribution as a red teamer it is more about, as you said before, trying not to stick out from crowds. So just be kind of like hiding in plain sight, right? So, and, and that's kind of why I brought up the technical versus non-technical, right? Um, because that you can do all the things technical in the world, but the, some of the non-technical things like uh, social misattribution, uh, what online connections and personal networks reveal about you. Uh, it, one of the things we talked about earlier was if uh, if I see that you have a star network, right, and nobody in that network knows each other, mm -hmm. right, it's pretty obvious that that's not a real persona. Right. But if you have friends that know each other, that know each other, we all kind of move in in common circles, right? So it you know, looks real. It, it, it does, right? yeah. And yeah. you know that that leads into financial uh, misattribution, right? Uh, uh, trying to hide uh, an operator's hand in paying for any services or capabilities to try to not stick out, right? Are they using a um, a, a tool or something that has been identified or or even breached, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's made the news here lately. Uh, and then linguistics or writing style, right? Um, when you're when you're typing your searches and stuff, are you double spacing between every other word or uh, you do that routinely, right? That, that's something that can eventually be tied back to you as an individual because you're not just sticking out, right? Not analyzing, everybody does. Analyzing behavior. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And I think that's a, one of the, the greatest uh, assets and capabilities of, of some of our, um, our government's agencies, right, is 
just having databases upon databases of known behaviors um, and, and actually getting out there and, and, and profiling those behaviors, right? Right. So those databases already exist, right? Yep. And then, so it's just a matter of taking a look and seeing what's out there and, and, and mapping them back, right? But it, it, what it also by though, I misattribution, when you started out and said that it is, uh, it could also be uh, identifying the wrong thing, right? The, the, uh, the most important thing when you're doing something as a researcher uh, is ensuring that you have permission to do that thing or use that tool, right? The, if you're working for a large organization that's in risk of you as an employee, you need to ensure that you're having that conversation up front uh, and they need to know the tools that you're using and obviously you know, licenses paid, et cetera, but sure. you know, uh, getting permission. Right. And it's a kind of a, an old CEH question of what's the difference between hacking and, and pen testing right. is permission. Right? Right. So just having permission is the differentiator there. Right, and if you're using their network, they want to make sure that the tools you're using are applicable and licensed and so on, right? So, um, and then a lot of times, when, you know, from a network perspective, you want to use a network outside of a corporate network, have a separate network and so on. So, yeah, you'd ask so, the, uh, about uh, non-attribution, right? Uh, non-attribution is really becoming harder, if not impossible. Um, you know, because eliminating all the identifying info uh, while you're online is, is extremely difficult. Hard to do. Exactly. Right. Exactly. right. right. So uh, I'd like to, to move to uh, managed attribution from that point. So we talked about non-attribution, misattribution, and so on. Um, so, from a cyber operator's perspective, the capability to manage their attribution uh, it, it be very important, right? So, if they're performing a specific job, uh, it, they want to be able to uh, intentionally mask, possibly, uh, you know, where they are, um, their identity, so they can either misattribute or be non-attributable, and so on. So. From the perspective of a cyber researcher or red teamer, how important is it to allow the user to be able to manage the levels of attribution in their environment? Well, I, that's really important. And I mean, that's what allows it to even be referred to as managed attribution, right? Because it's really all about the story you want to convey. Uh, it's an active process of requiring the creation and maintenance of visible information that you'll lead others to the desired state of attribution, right? So if I want somebody to think that I am just a random person in a random location, then I need to manage that randomness, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and it has to be a repeatable process, right? That uh, that doesn't become um, something can be done through static analysis, right? Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, tools and techniques, and, and, and not just tools from the perspective of, you know, what tools do you use specifically, uh, although we can discuss a little bit about some of the things that are done in these environments, but really what I'm concerned about from the perspective of doing a cyber operator's job, using the tools and techniques that they need to do to get their mission accomplished, how do they set up an environment so that these tools and techniques aren't putting unwanted information out uh, for cyber adversaries to see and and target them by, uh, and and what kind of things can be done to prevent some of that? Well, I mean, the, so the number one concern to business, right, is doing business, right? The the enterprise thing is the ability to do business and. What that business is, or how, uh, or what the byproduct of the business is, varies. But the need uh, to to do security at the speed of business never changes, uh, and doing it securely from the beginning ensures longevity and success. Right. So you know, investing in the right tools, the right infrastructure, and making sure that it's done right the first time and those conversations are had from the beginning are are critical to the success of the company and the ability to do. Right. The, the notes that I had taken uh, when we were preparing, you know, is is remembering that at the the nation state level, uh, 
distribution may undermine a state's credibility and lead to political differences, right? Mm -hmm. So you can think about the blowout uh, and fallout that, that could occur from um, either you know, uh, misattribution from uh, a researcher standpoint of being wrong, or um, you know, uh, if you get to the nation state level of one uh, nation state accusing another nation state of something, uh, even if it's right or wrong, the, the fallout that it could occur, right? it's pretty, pretty uh, intense uh, scenarios. But even to the individual, right? Uh, one of the most well-known researchers uh, in the world is Brian Krebs. Um, and that, that gentleman, uh, you know, fellow researcher, uh, has, has learned a lot of lessons the hard way unintentionally. You know, he's uh, uh, been targeted. Uh, not everybody's going to agree with what you have to say or the research, even if you're right. Even right. if you have the facts, right? If you're making uh, assertions that can uh, be backed up by uh, quantifiable facts, not everybody's going to want to hear that. Right? Yeah. There are a lot of aspects to what we're talking about that, you know, uh, you know when I think of, you know, uh, problems with cyber attribution and, and, and problems with going out and doing research, you know, I think about, uh, you know, uh, protecting myself, protecting my organization, making sure I don't open up attack vectors so that my organization network gets hacked and so on. But a lot of things you're bringing up are very valuable, too, that sometimes people don't think about. If you're out there as a cyber researcher, you're putting information out that someone doesn't like, right? You, you got to be careful there also. So that's a very important con conversation to have. So um, uh, I'd like to, to step ahead and, and I want to talk about some industry solutions uh, that have been out in the market for quite a while that um, uh, that uh, are available. I mean, the, the market is, uh, there's a lot of industry out there, a lot of folks tools that uh, are out there to help these, these types of situations that we've been talking about. You know, from you know secure VPNs to remote uh, isolated browsers, uh, virtual obfuscation networks, uh, e even uh, to the point of uh, deception networks. Uh, there's there's organizations out there building uh, virtualized networks that can be moved, uh, moving targets, taking them down, bringing them back up, and so on. Uh, you know, and and it's very important to be able to hide your network resources and, and mask the identities of operators and misattribute locations and so on. So uh, as a, a security researcher, David, can, can you talk a little bit about some of the things you look for in a capability to meet your needs as a security researcher? I always fall back on the preface, right, that as a security researcher employed by a large organization, right, it's not my uh, privilege or responsibility to accept the risk, right? So, you know, in that being said, um, if I was the person making the decision, asking those questions to a service provider, uh, you know, some of the things that I ask is, uh, where is the super, uh, service provider based, right? Uh, you know, what SLAs are guaranteed? Uh, what what comes with those guarantees? Are there uh, key performance indicators that can be measured, um, you know, to measure the performance or of, of the, the contract between the two companies, right? Um, do they collect logs? You know, if so, what logs? Uh, where are they stored? What's the retention policy on them? Um, can they walk me through the protection process? Like, I don't necessarily need to know how it works, but I need to know that they're confident that it works, right? Is, uh, is there any type of insurance provided? Uh, uh, a good example of this uh, uh, is the, the gentleman who founded Lightbox. Right, uh, he used to put his social security number on the internet, mm -hmm. and uh, you know he eventually got out. Right, mm -hmm. uh, but that company provides up to a million dollars in insurance to those who are owned, um, and and that's right there gives you a little bit of peace of mind when you're looking at something like that. Now it's a little bit different from you know, anonymization, right? But yeah, it, that'd it, be it, very interesting <laughs> to yeah, yeah. find a company that says. I have this product, yeah, and, and it'll and, keep and you anonymous, and yeah. I'll insure you against it, right? That's, yeah, I don't uh, think it exists. That. <laughs> if it does, though, you know, I think there's probably a huge business case for that, yeah. and that would take uh, some serious, uh, serious uh, backing. But you know, yeah. the last thing I, I also ask uh, is about cost, right? So, uh, what are the accepted forms of payment, right? Is it cash? Mm. Is cash an option? Cash, everybody knows cash is the root of all evil and all criminal enterprise. Uh, checks, I mean, who writes checks these days? But what's a uh, check? Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? Uh, and would you write a check, right? Uh, 
because a bank accounts obviously come back to a real person um, as do credit cards, right? Uh, uh, and Bitcoin, right? Everybody thinks there's a level of anonymity with uh, Bitcoin, but that's right. absolutely not the case, right? Because right. That's a very interesting point. Yeah, because I, I have heard that. It's like, well, we'll just use Bitcoin for that. Yeah. But, uh, explain why that's not so, really I mean, as secure as people think it is. A great example, right? Let's talk about Silk Road, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's really kind of what put Bitcoin in, in the news, yeah, right? Uh, uh, and I think it's funny, uh, a story that I have, um, I'm part of a cybersecurity working group at the FBI, and uh, when I, I would talk to our, our local agent uh, at this time before Silk Road happened, they had an official stance that Bitcoin was not a form of currency. Mm. Well, you know, several months later, Silk Road hits the news. I come back and I'm like, hey, what the heck? You right. said this wasn't a form of currency. And he says, oh, well, we've changed our policy that anything that can be exchanged for something is considered a form of currency. Uh, I was like, yeah. well, that, that's pretty laughable, right? Yeah. But, you know, in, in the Silk Road example, right, there was a, um, uh, a U.S. Marshal that was busted stealing uh, Bitcoins from the seized Bitcoins that uh, were seized. This, this is all in the news, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, how that person was caught is that in Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency, the blockchain technology makes every single transaction ever made Available okay, to everybody, sure. right? So if you have the time and the means and the persistence, you can actually track back a transaction to an individual or an organization, and that kind of goes back to the non-technical um, conversation of uh, you know financial attribution. Right? Yeah, yeah, good point. Thank you very much for that. So when you started this conversation, though, about you know what things you look for, I think the one of the first things you mentioned was uh, where the company's located or where the infrastructure is located. You know, can, can you talk a little bit about what the potential issues are there? Well, you know, so if it's in the US, right, uh, there's obviously laws in place that uh, protect uh, companies and, and data retention um, for government agencies, but there's, there's nothing in place that uh, says what the data retention policy can be for uh, companies like uh, Amazon or, or Google or you know any of the big data companies, but outside of the U.S., it gets more interesting, right? There are uh, nation states that have established a sovereign internet, right? In order to do business in that country, you have to give unfettered access to your company's resources and data um, at, at a moment's notice, right? Mm -hmm. And and that's a really scary thing, right? Uh, especially when you're trying to be anonymous in in that area, right? The area of operation. Uh, look at Singapore. Singapore has the strictest hacking laws in the world, uh, some of which are punishable by uh, debt. Right. Wow. So you know you 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 talk about our our law here is the the most commonly abused law is the CFAA, right? And uh, um, the the penalties for that can be severe. If you're a researcher or you're a hacker, right? right? Uh, so you know knowing the legal frameworks in your geographical area of uh, interest are pretty important to know if you're trying to be um, have any type of anonymity in that area. Right. So a lot of these networks, though, that are out on the market today, even if the company is, is a U.S.-based company, uh, they provide points of presence all over the world. So uh, in some cases, depending on where they're located, that could be risky, right? Oh, absolutely. And uh, we, we, we won't mention the company's name that's been in the news in the last couple of days, right? But uh, a Big Ten VPN service provider was breached and uh, you know, nobody is really sure uh, for, with any certainty whether uh, client data was uh, breached. But of course, the company has said that it has not been. Um, and you know, there's a lot of thought leaders out there right now that are uh, telling people to roll their own VPNs, right? right. right. And then just back to what we talked about earlier. I mean, the cost yeah. of doing that and doing it right yeah. is extremely expensive. I mean, you're doing 100 percent right. Exactly. I mean, right. you're better off becoming your yeah. own service provider, which is ridiculous in itself, right? But uh, you know, trying to roll your own VPN, um, you, you probably won't have the resources or the know-how to do that 100% right, 100% of the time. Right, right. Great discussion. Thank you very much. So, so this, this slide is kind of getting back to what we talked about a little earlier, I believe it was on slide six. Uh, so the, the need for this is expand everywhere, really, right? So uh, a lot of these capabilities that we've talked about that are available in the marketplace and that are continuing to evolve 
in the marketplace are really focused towards you know some kind of unique specific markets, right? Cyber operators, you know, whether it's the DOD, the intelligence agencies, and so on. But uh, the need for this is a whole lot more than just that. You know, we have you know, uh, healthcare records that need to be protected. We have financial transactions that need to be protected. We have senior leaders of major organizations that travel around the world that want to be able to communicate with each other and be anonymous and be protected and so on. So um, I, I'd love for you to talk just a, just a little bit more about some of the things that, uh, that, that you see going on with, with, with some of the organizations that we spoke about earlier. You know, whether it's, you know, not just competitive research, but financial reporting and healthcare and market intelligence, of course, energy exploration, possibly uh, legal proceedings and so on. Um, you know, but we've covered a lot today mm -hmm. in, in some of the, the other discussions. But uh, can you talk a little bit about um, some more details about non cyber operations uh, and, and, uh, and what we can do to protect that? Well, I mean, it, it's easy to get into uh, rabbit chasing discussions when you start talking about cybersecurity, especially with the, you know, I, I see something cyber shiny and I start chasing it. But, uh, you know, the needs change vastly if it's an individual versus an organization. And the risk exposure has different consequences, right? So we talk about, uh, you mentioned banking. Well, I work in financial services, right? Uh, business email compromise is probably one of the biggest threats uh, mm -hmm. to uh, banking, but it's not a banking problem, right? Uh, it's a third party. Uh, so, you know, it's it's a, a lawyer getting hacked that's doing an escrow between two people, right? Right. That's right. not anything that the bank, other than training somebody, hey, don't click on links and, right. you know, verify your wire instructions before you you them. Uh, but, you know, I, I think learning, regardless of what the, the sector is, learning from the mistakes of other people, especially um, known adversaries, uh, one of the first ones that pops to mind is Sabu, right? Uh, you know, he was caught because the one time out of a hundred times that he used a VPN, he didn't. Yeah. And, you know, the FBI was able to subpoena the ISP, and from there that led to his physical location. Yeah, he was one of the professionals, really. I mean, he was, exactly. he was great at it, doing it over and over and over again until that one until time. that one right? time, yeah. 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 The, uh, the the stereotype of what not to do though um, is is definitely the DNC hackers and I'm I'm not in the politics whatsoever but you know if you could so that's like going from one time to many times right? <laughs> well I mean if, if you could say like a a classic scenario of what not to do um, it would be looking at this situation right and and there were you know uh, eight mistakes that you can count um, that could have easily been uh, mitigated, uh, you know, account reuse, IP reuse, known malware, right? Uh, uh, those are some of the types of mistakes. I identifying metadata, um, their writing style, right? We mentioned that earlier, oh, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, it, it, it really yeah. flows back into technical versus non-technical. They made mistakes on both sides of the house. Yeah, they, even the financial transactions exactly, back to yeah. actually buying servers or infrastructure. Yeah, and so the tools right? they use, yeah. yeah. They, it's tools they chose to use and, and the timing, right? right? So the timing of what they were doing, um, you know, really was a, a, a perfect example of what not to do. Now, you know, this, this conversation is really targeted towards people that are doing the right thing and trying to do the right thing at the speed of business. Yes, exactly. And, yeah, and yeah. I would say that, you know, learning lessons from people that are not doing the right thing is a good, you know, path mm -hmm. um, to understanding the risk, right? right? So the risk to the organization, and even in the uh, case of an individual, the risk of the individual. Fantastic. Um, well, great. I uh, appreciate all of that. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do now is, is just talk about, uh, so you know, as part of Telos's mission uh, to empower and protect the enterprise, you know, we offer a capability of lives, you know, some of uh, the uh, technical side of the attribution in, in some of the areas we discussed today uh, to provide privacy and security and, and anonymous, anonymously over the internet. Um, and um, you know, a lot of the conversation we had today. Uh, and uh, I'd like to talk uh, too uh, 
uh, on the next slide. Um, you mentioned earlier, to your point, uh, and I'd like to thank you for bringing that up. That, you know, this slide kind of talks a little bit about um, the um, the capability uh, and an example of technical versus non-technical attribution. And uh, I wondered if you could kind of use this diagram as a way to, to dig into that just a little bit more. Yeah, and I, you know, I really love that you chose this infographic, right? Because it, it, it just demonstrates how much info is out there uh, and the difficulty involved with non-attribution, managed attribution, and attribution in itself, right? Uh, which kind of brings us full circle to the, the why conversation, right? Everything right. starts with why. So, you know, assessing why you need to have a, a research team or a red team, or that, that answer is gonna be different for every organization, or even if it's an individual, it's gonna be different for every individual. But the slide really does uh, show just a, a, you know, a, a small taste of the things that can be out there. I mean, think about it like this, right? Your, your browser tells on you. Your uh, computer, uh, the Wi-Fi hotspot that you might be at in a Starbucks right. tells on you. These are things that you don't have control over, right? So you may be using a VPN, but at the end of the day, it'll come back to some type of uh, attributable source, right? That right. Uh, with enough time and persistence uh, and resources uh, can eventually super timeline and, and put a person at a place at a time doing a thing, whether you know, that thing is a good thing or a bad thing. It it, it, uh, it follows low card's principle uh, 100%. And, and in digital crime or uh, even in, in this case, digital research, right, uh, it, it can all be tied back to you leaving something behind. And that, that follows low card's principle, right? Uh, and when you do something, you always leave something behind. Right, yeah, so you talked about browsers. I mean, of course, there's ways, there's tools out there. There's, you know, companies that have products that allow you to go in and set specific attributes, right, within your browser. But, I mean, how many attributes are within a browser? You know, you're not gonna get them all. Right? There's a lot, and yeah. you know, you also don't wanna be too anonymous, right? Yeah, uh, exactly. Because then yeah. you then yeah. can be attributed to, right. to being a thing, doing a yeah. thing at a place yeah. Time, right? Yeah, so, so, you want, <laughs> so you want to do things like, you know, set time and dates and location you think you're coming out of and, and things like that, but, uh, but you're right. You, number one, don't wanna to be too anonymous. But on the, on the other hand, you want to make sure you catch the attributes that are going out to the internet so that it doesn't lead them back to you. Right? And, and then you also want to tie back into uh, the legalities too, right? Like uh, there's a fine line between impersonation yeah, and, and non-attribution, right? Yep. So yep. You, if you're doing something that's not attributable, you want to just fit in wherever you're trying to, uh, to work out of, whether it's yep. Germany or where, whatever location, uh, but you don't want to try to, especially for an organization that's not uh, within a government agency, right? Yeah. You don't want to portray uh, an adversarial threat or their um, your TTPs. Yeah, because, fitting in is. I mean, that's that's a great thing that you've you've taught me in our discussions, really, over the past you know some time that we've been talking. Is that you know making sure you fit into the environment that you are. Uh, where your location is. I mean, that's just so important. It's like hiding in plain sight, right? Yes. So that's that's really important. So uh, thank you very much, David. Hey, I really for appreciate your time. I appreciate it. And broader, thank you both for the presentation, Tom and David. Um, now I'd like to open up the floor for any questions that the audience may have. So please feel free to submit a question into the WebEx Q&A box, or you can submit them directly to the TELUS Corporation account through the chat. While we um, wait for those to come in, I have a question for you guys. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> does using a virtual machine help in managing your attribution? Yes and no, right? So it, it, and I, I, I hate this response when I get it from players, right? But it really depends. Um, if that, that virtual machine does the footprint on the host, uh, I would agree. Um, if you're using that out of a, a cloud hosted uh, environment, we can get back into the conversation about technical versus non-technical, right? A at some point, you're gonna have to pay for that, right? Uh, if you're using AWS, they don't take cash. Not to my knowledge anyways, right? Uh, and, and cash is really the only true way to be anonymous and viewed as 
the the root of all criminal enterprise, right? Yeah. However, on the other hand, you know, that an advantage it does provide, a couple of it, probably, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but it does separate your actual device from, you know, uh, from uh, whatever infrastructure you're using to misattribute your or mask your identity and location, right? So it provides a level of protection if or if you have information on your device that could possibly go out and create digital exhaust in the environment that is unwanted, maybe using that VM and setting that VM up cleanly is a way to help provide that level of, of attribution you're looking well, for. Let's, right? let's take it to a scary level, right? Let's say you're on a VM that doesn't record any data, it's not persistent at all, you reboot it, there's no evidence on that VM, but you're doing something that's uh, you know, questionable, whether it's cyber research or um, let's say you're Johnny Joe Hacker doing something in a Starbucks, right? It's it's not the VM necessarily that's going to get you outed. Uh, it's what you're doing on that VM that will get you outed, right? Uh, you know, right. I, I, I joke yeah. about this uh, that you know, every bank robber robs a bank the same way, but no bank robber robs a bank the same way, right? right some right. people come in and give a note. Some people come in guns a blazing. Right, each person has their own signature, and that's no different in adversarial threats. Right, uh, I, I I know uh, back in the day with violent crimes, right, uh, they would send uh, things up to Quantico for uh, behavior analysis. Right, mm -hmm. I that, that's there's no way that that's not happening now sure. with cyber crime and the the things that you do. Like, do you get on and run an Nmap scan within 30 seconds of getting into your host environment? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, if you do and you don't wait two minutes, that's a signature, right? If you do it the same uh, way that's right, repeatable, right, right. it really point. doesn't matter what you're doing it from. Uh, but what I mentioned with uh, using a cloud service provider VM, that provides a little bit of anonymity, but it goes back to the conversation of how do you pay for it, right? Uh, if you pay with a credit card, well, uh, if it was a gift card, we can find out where that gift card was purchased at. Anybody with the means can you know, walk it back to, all right, you bought this gift card at a CVS in New York on Fifth Street. Right. Well, you bought it at 9.30. So with the proper uh, subpoenas in hand, uh, that place can turn over their video logs if they exist. And now you have a picture of the person that bought yeah. that gift card yeah. at the time and the place. Yeah. And then from there, it just kind of unravels, right? Yeah, so that, that subject has come up a lot in this discussion. Yeah, that, I mean, the fighting transactions uh, is really something that can really derive the, the actual user's identity. Right? It, but, you know, it, again, though, the, the, the target audience uh, for this particular conversation isn't the, the adversary, the, the adversary right. right? It's exactly. the, the yeah. red teamer who's trying to do right. research and the Palo Alto firewall is blocking right. their efforts because they're, they're doing uh, restrictions based on uh, subject matter, right? So sure, but again, if they're building an environment to help them do their job, these are things that they need to be aware of too, right? Yeah, and I mean, you know, talking about uh, Mr. Credits, right? If the certain organizations I work for, if I tried to go to Krebs' website, it was blocked because he writes about right and then it's blocked by category type right there's sure there isn't a yeah. category type for you know cyber security researcher right it's right. hacker yes <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, good so hopefully that answered the question i i think it, it really depends um it may not be the action that's happening from the vm but uh what you're doing with the vm that actually attributes you eventually um we have a question from sandra as red team pen testers use to access an environment, and what tools do you use during your assessment? So tell me two separate questions. Yeah, so you know, uh, a good magician never exposes their <laughs> tricks, right? Uh, uh, but uh, what I'd say is, you know, ensuring as a red teamer that you've had that conversation with your employer and the uh, scope of what you're doing with red team activities has been thoroughly vetted and the risk has been accepted. Uh, I, I, I always love the conversation when we're talking about red teaming versus pen testing versus vulnerability assessments. And you know, I've been doing this for 22 years now and I can count on my hand with uh, my civilian employers that uh, have allowed me to do 
real red teaming, right? So real red teaming, in my opinion, you know, is going to be an outage if I do my job right. It's it's really the measurement of the resilience to the specific attack vector and how you do it um, that is measured, and you're getting a, a score based on your resiliency to that thing, right? Anything else? Uh, there's a, a debate about pen testing and vulnerability assessments, but you know, really it boils down to the risk acceptance that the the, the client or the organization is willing to accept. And as a follow-up to that, who should you talk to or which departments in your organization to make sure you have the right protections air cover in place before undertaking evasion techniques? Well, I mean, it, it all starts with your most to, uh, at my organization, there are several stakeholders. There's legal, there's public relations, there's, you know, so you have to have media training, right? You have to know what you can talk about, what you can't talk about. Um, it, it's really no different than working in a classified environment versus an unclassified environment. You know, even when you're debriefing the client, you have to be careful on how you do that so that there is no hurt feelings or nobody feels like they were unnecessarily targeted. If social engineering was allowed, right, the, the uh, organization that you work for might uh, take that offensively, right, that you didn't trust them, that you took advantage of their trust in you. And those are all things that are remember so that's why it's important to have legal at the table it's important to have somebody from hr at the table uh, if your organization has a corporate investigations team they should have a seat at the table uh, to you know kind of vet what it is that you're trying to achieve with a, a true red team i mean a, a true red team encompasses physical security uh, and, and the technical security controls um, so when you're doing that, there's a lot of risk that has to be talked about. If your organization has armed guards, right. that's a huge risk, right? Like they need to be aware that this and, is happening. And and at times, our, a lot of those responsibilities lie on the shoulders of the cyber of the red teamer, the research. But for uh, the, these types of capabilities uh, are really just starting to. Uh, become evident in uh, small to mid-size, even some large companies. So red teaming, cyber researching within these, you know, uh, commercial organizations may be something new to them, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of times it's on the shoulders of the researcher themselves to make sure they bring the right folks together. Is that true? Well, I, I think it, it, it takes a, a, a lot of maturity too, right? Um, one of my industry mentors, uh, Chris Neckerson, owns a company called Layers, and they are fantastic at red teaming. Um, you know, if if you give them access to um, do a uh, no holds barred red team, they're going to be successful, right? It, it's 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 the level of risk you're willing to accept, right? And it always it, it always goes back to that. Um, it, you know, and, and what I learned from him is ensuring without a doubt that you know what your left and right limits are getting into it. And this, this is specifically to red team engagements, right? It's a little different than you know, cybersecurity research. Right. Uh, well, cybersecurity research, I'm not breaking into a building and I'm not, there's no chance of scope creep. I mean, the worst thing that you could probably do as a cybersecurity researcher is having uh, your own tool bag, right? That uh, wasn't necessarily uh, uh, granted by your organization or or right. wasn't on their radar, right? right. But right. Uh, we all have our, our own tools that we're used to using. Uh, I would think that as a red teamer, you need to make sure that you have permission to do what you're going to do and they understand the risk of right. what can happen if it goes wrong. Right. Sense. Great. Okay, we have another question. Can we just use a silo cloud browser instead of using non-attribution techniques? Well, so, you know, um, you but there's, there's several products other than just a silent browser. Um, and there's a, a number of companies that provide that type of service. What I would question though is what controls do you have with that particular tool? And, and I won't get into a vendor conversation, right? But uh, can you change your header controls? Can you change what the user agent is? Can you manipulate anything? Because if you can't, uh, those... Those are things that could now make you a right? Uh, you might not necessarily be called out as company X doing a thing Y, but you'll certainly be called out as using a tool which 
you know, it could get you blacklisted uh, for the type of research that you're doing. Okay, and last question. Do these capabilities rely on IP hopping for network obfuscation? So there are a number of technologies in the market that are you know, what's called IP hoppers. Uh, in fact, go back four years uh, when uh, these types of products first started coming out on the market, a lot of the secure VPNs on the market are, you know, can be termed an IP hopper. I mean, uh, what they do is they allow you to, you know, access a, a VPN, uh, they switch your IP address, and then you're out on the internet with an IP address that's not your physical IP address. So that's kind of a typical IP hopper kind of solution. Uh, and, and that's one level of capability that's in the market. Uh, there are a number of other capabilities in the market, like um, you know, taking that first step, really, uh, to, to, to use VPN to connect to a different type of a network uh, that really uh, protects you inside, it, it creates a private network in the internet, for example, that provides multiple other levels of network obfuscation, varying data paths, multiple layers of encryption that eliminate source and destination IP addresses so that activity can't be traced back to the source and so on. That's well beyond an IP hopper type of capability, but they can be used in conjunction with each other. Uh, as can, you know, us, uh, whoever asked the silo question before, you know, taking, a, uh, taking an isolated browser uh, and using that as the jump off point to an obfuscated network. So there's a number of different ways that these networks can be architected uh, to, to meet the specific needs of, of, of the user. Well, a, a caveat onto that, right? So part of our discussion was technical and non-technical, right? And the IP hopping specifically is a technical uh, control, but I'll, I'll let's say, make this comment. We'll talk about the non-technical stuff. So when you are having those difficult conversations with the service provider, if you can have them, right? There's some that won't even respond to you, uh, but you know, what is their pool of IP addresses? Right. right? Nothing's truly random. So right. if they only had a hundred, and let's say they only had for a particular area of operations that you want to work out of, right? How truly random is that? And, you know, it goes back to what I was talking about. It's it, it's about your actions, attributable, right? That make you stick out. Sure, you may come from a random IP address in country X, right? But the whole point is to not stick out in the crowd, right? But the minute that you come from the same 50 random IPs and you're doing the same thing over and over, or you're looking for the same over and over, that very quickly allows you to be retrievable. Um, and you know that goes back to our conversation on technical controls, right? Mm -hmm. How did you pay for all of this, right? And right. Uh, you know, in, in your social networks, right? Um, if if I can establish a method of payment uh, for you individual and then I can now uncover your network and I see that people within your network know each other mm -hmm. I know that I'm probably dead on that I'm correct with my uh, assertion of who you are or where you're coming from right. but if I see that your network is you know full of people that don't know each other have no ability to collude with each other then that might be a fake persona right, right. but uh, I, I, I I always caveat any discussion about attribution non-attribution is that one with the resources and the means and the time mm -hmm. can attribute a source. Sure. Right? Mm -hmm. And then getting back to the IP hopper you know, question, uh, there are a number of different technologies that are available in the market today, and you know, capabilities have you know a, a, a dynamic IP hopping capability within their environment. So, you know, you may have one hop to get you to a capability. And then there are multiple hops within that environment. And those hops change all the time. They vary. So, uh, so there are a lot of technologies available in the market um, uh, to, to help these cyber operators do their job. You just got to find one that takes cash. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> well, thank you all for joining us for our webinar. Thank you again, Tom and David, for that lively discussion.
For more information about Telos Ghost or anything discussed during the presentation, please reach out to Adam Elliott. His information is on the screen now. Or visit our website, telos.com. Have a great day.